I grew up, well, I was born in Berkeley, California. Oh. And I was there in the San Jose area for about four years um, before moving across the country to North Carolina, where I spent 13 years of my life. Wow. In High Point, North Carolina, which is the furniture capital of the world. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, were your parents artistic at all? Um, you know, my mother was. She studied fashion. Um, my mother was born in Brazil, and uh, she studied fashion in Miami and met my father. My father was playing for the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, oh, wow. Football. Yeah. And um, they got married. Uh, they had two kids. I have an older sister. Um, my father, on the other hand, worked for Hewlett Packard and was not artistic at all. Um, <laughs> he did uh, stuff called quality enhancement. And so he would go into big corporations uh, like Citibank and teach them how to improve their systems. So wow. quality within their business. Um, so the opposite of the arts. Kind of like the two Bobs from Office Space. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I definitely had a, an, an influence on the mom side uh, creatively. Uh -huh. uh, and then I've got my OCD from my father. So then where did you get this love of acting from? Where did, where did it all start for you? How did you get so the bug? How did you catch it? You know, it started in kindergarten. Um, I was, I mean, I, I imagine it actually started in the womb, but I really have nothing to back that up. Um, <laughs> but in kindergarten, I did an alphabet play and I was the letter F for fancy feet. And I did a ridiculous little dance and the audience laughed and clapped, and I was hooked. <laughs> and then uh, later in elementary school, I did um, The Little Red Hen, and I was The Little Red Hen, and it just, it spun from there. And I just wanted to be performing all the time, all the time, uh, making up stories and uh, performing. I'm curious, who was your first role model? Who, who influenced you and share, and took you under their wing and gave you some lessons to cherish? Yeah. Um, my first theater teacher was a lady by the name of Teresa Fowler. And um, she really looked beyond my juvenile delinquency and <laughs> uh, saw how important it was uh, how important theater was, how important acting was to me. She gave me a lot of opportunities, even when I didn't deserve them. Um, even after I blew some of them, you know, uh, making poor choices, hanging around uh, the wrong kind of folk. Um, and, and that was in North Carolina. And then when I moved to Colorado when I was 17, um, it was a man by the name of Wally Larson. And he was the high school teacher at Highlands Ranch High School, uh, the drama drama uh, teacher. And he also gave me opportunities that I, I didn't really deserve. Um, he made me, I had a terrible haircut when I was 17. I had these long bangs and then half of my head was shaved. So I had this <laughs> identity crisis going on on my head. 
Um, much like my my quarantine mullet. Yeah, you like that? That's it's a good time right there. I was so grateful the, the two years that I spent in Highlands Ranch High School. I, I really was given focus uh, in theater and in acting, and it really pushed me beyond into my career. Um, uh, he was a special kind of guy. He he directed with a cane too, so whenever he was upset, he would slam his cane down on the ground. Do it again. <laughs> it was tough love, but it really, it really worked. You know, it's funny because like most actors start with the stage aspect of what they do, right? I mean, yeah. there's no, there's no, it's very rare that an actor started with commercials and, and, and film and doing all that. I mean, there yeah. are cases yeah. of that, but those are usually people who have been, whose people, whose parents or somebody they know has been in the industry and that's how they got started with that. And so, I mean, theater, theater really gives you that that foundation of acting, doesn't it? I mean, it really teaches you how to ground you as an actor. Yeah, I mean, I think also it's geographical, right? So like if you right. grow up in, in LA, you're more likely to participate, or in New York, you're more likely to participate in the film that's happening around. Um, but if you're in a small town, uh, High Point, North Carolina, <laughs> you don't have those opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and so theater is definitely the outlet. And even in Denver, you know, we, we've grown an industry after kind of losing an industry and mm -hmm. we still, we don't have a lot of stuff going on. Um, so yeah, theater was definitely uh, the playing field and I'm so grateful it was because I love theater with all of my heart and I love the whole process from the beginning to the end. Um, mm -hmm. I love the collaboration with artists. Uh, I love the live experience. Um, and I love the kinds of stories I get to tell on stage, which I don't often get that opportunity in film because the really great stories are going to the much larger names. Um, and so to be able to tell both classic uh, stories in theater, uh, the Tennessee Williams, the Arthur Millers, you know, um, and then the very new contemporary, what's hot in the theater right now, um, mm -hmm. has been an absolute blessing. Uh, I, I love telling the, the, the stories of the stage. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you'll always be a, a stage actor, that you'll you'll go back to it every every now and again, even yeah. if it offers opportunity? Yeah, I mean, clearly we're not doing theater anytime soon. Right, um, right. <laughs> sadly, uh, there are very few opportunities, and with good reason, you know, we want to keep our audience safe, but, safe, but we also want to keep uh, the actors safe as well. Um, and we can't really tell those stories, you know, live on stage. Um, yeah. but I will always return to the stage. Um, there's, there's a piece of my heart that is connected to theater. There is a piece of my soul that yearns to, to tell these stories. You know, I can only go so long before I have to go do a play. It, it just <laughs> pulls at me and yeah. I, I I need it in my life so much. I love uh, connecting in that way, both with my fellow artists and, and the audience. Um, right. So yeah, you know, I, I would see myself doing a show a year. Um, nice, wow. At the, at the minimum, um, I really, it keeps me sharp as well. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I think doing live performance, um, being on your toes in that way, uh, having that exchange of energy between uh, you and the audience, um, the energy that it creates inside you, uh, it, it keeps me uh, a better actor. The brain is like, you know, those memorizing muscles, you have to keep working them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a big commitment, though. That's, those are usually like a six-month commitment, aren't they? You, you're you're um, you're really putting a lot of faith faith in the community at that point if you're doing something like that. It is a very long commitment, and that is, you know, what I've struggled with the most recently mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is how much time theater takes. Because you know, you can be in rehearsal for five or six weeks, and then add a show on top of that that could be, you know, seven or eight weeks on the average, you know, because you do do the shows that are only two weeks or three weeks. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, you're looking at at least a couple of month commitment. 
And while you're doing that, it's very hard to do film during that time because you can't change a performance. Like the performance is set in stone. Uh, yeah. There's really no flexibility within that. Uh, so it's hard. And I, you know, I made a commitment last year after I did the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime um, that it would be my last show for a while. Uh, so that I could really focus on film and see what film kind of had in store for me as far as having this feature come out uh, where I'm the lead, my first feature as the lead. And, um, you know, and then the pandemic hit. So, you know, you can't really gauge anything uh, <laughs> off of that, but at yeah. least I have the film that was already in the can. So. Yeah. Other than the scars on your wrist from the cane that you got, <laughs> the caning that you got on your teeth. <laughs> um, what do you remember about some of those early performances that really stand out for you? Um, oh, man. My first professional show was at the Aurora Fox, and it was a play called Lion in Winter. And, um, you know, we wore all the big clothing, the heavy capes, and it was, yeah. you know, Henry and Eleanor, and it's just a classic story. Um, we got to perform that in Civic Center Park. Uh, oh, wow. They would do this theater in the park during the summer where they would pick these shows from the, the theater year and they would mount them in the park. And so I got to perform in front of like, and mind you, I'm like 20. <laughs> um, I got to perform in front of like two or 3,000 people uh, in this story that kind of takes place with the pillars. You know, if you're not familiar with Civic Center Park, it's, you know, old kind of Roman looking uh, pillars and the Denver skyline, like right in front of you. I remember going out from a curtain call and seeing, you know, this like throngs of people, two or 3,000, because it was all, it was free show. Yeah. So there were so many people. And I was like, oh my God, I've arrived. You know, <laughs> little did I know that I had like a 25 year journey ahead of me um, of not arriving, um, but doing my art. Yeah. And, like that's that set me up for what was to come like that i really solidified my commitment to my craft and my art uh doing that first professional show um and then you know like i've done i did a production of zoo story in ireland where we switched roles each night we did the whole true west thing um I did a streetcar named Desire in Columbus, Mississippi for the Tennessee Williams Festival uh, in his hometown of Columbus, um, which was you know, one of the finest theatrical experiences I've ever had. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten to do some really incredible theater uh, just by putting myself out there, you know, and just working on the craft. How about film experiences? Do you remember any of your early film experiences? Yes, film wise, you know, just finding uh, an outlet for film was was a little challenging. So there was a ton of food and films. Um, I, I remember I did this project called Reach, um, where I played a mentally handicapped uh, kid. And, you know, I, Leo uh, DiCaprio was such a role model. Gilbert Grape was so impactful uh, on me that it was kind of a dream to be able to play uh, a character like that. Um, they used a lot of, you know, which they came to find out that they really shouldn't have, but they used a lot of Radiohead in their film. And then when, when they went to go like submit it to film festivals, they realized that they couldn't use that Radiohead. Yeah. Um, but watching the film with the Radiohead was so wonderful to see, you know, and it's, it's really overacted on my part, like uh, way over the top, but I had these moments of like really great work. Um, and I just remember being on set, working on a longer story. Um, and it was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I love that collaboration and I loved telling stories in this way. Um, and it really made me kind of push while I had this theater career, whenever given the opportunity to make a film, I would really laugh. Yeah. I remember that performance. I think it's the first thing I saw. Yeah, I think I, I do remember that. Just do something. You're
you're a man. You could wave at her. Yeah, your people wave all the time. It's just a friendly gesture. I just wave at her. Uh, no. Just do it. It's it's not hard at all. Just wave at her. Uh, is there a technique or ritual or trick per se that you've used in early performances that you still use today? Yes. Um, I mean, I would put it more in the, the ritual category. Mm. Um, at a very early age, uh, early age, no, early in my 20s, um, I learned how to juggle. Okay. And juggling has served me in so many different ways. Um, during my theater career, I did a ton of children's theater. Um, I did children's theater probably for 20 years, which was like my day job um, to support my acting in the evening. Um, yeah. And so, you know, through that, I, I learned uh, a lot of clowning, and a lot of juggling, and I still juggle before every performance. Um, I still juggle uh, at the beginning of the day on set. Um, it is part of my warm up. Um, I find that it is the one thing that brings me into the moment the quickest. Nice. Uh, meaning just present, focused. Uh, it gives me clarity. Uh, it, it hones in my focus like a laser. Are you a fan of rehearsals? Do you like them? Why or why not? Oh, man, I love rehearsals. I think, I think rehearsals are key to really dig into the work that you're doing. And I also think that table work is really important. Um, mm. Starting off a process with some table work, getting on the same page as your director and fellow actors, um, as you explore whatever piece that you're doing, and then rehearsals, absolutely. Um, because here's the thing, is like you get to find all these wonderful um, discoveries through the rehearsal process, you're working clearly on the obvious, on your lines, um, on on your environment. What's what's what is the world that you're working within? And then, when you get to the show or when you get to filming, you're still allowed those discoveries with all of this foundation. And I think, I think the work just deepens and is more specific. And I, for me, specificity is everything in this art, is mm -hmm. being specific in your choices, being specific in your character, uh, and being specific in the story that you're telling. Guys, come take a look at this. Now give me a second. Okay, that's the first one. Now hang on. This is the best one. And if you find that you and your fellow actors or you and the director are telling different stories, that is really gonna affect the overall shape of the play or the film. Yeah, there's there's something to be said for finding the chemistry, right? I mean, absolutely. And I mean, there's know, something to be uh, said for the spontaneity of a moment. Like, yeah, you know, sure. I'm not discarding that because I think that's important too. That you allow room for, you know, having that first take and, and something wonderful happening, um, yeah. or being on stage and something amazing happening between the two actors. But I think it comes best when there's a foundation first. Mm -hmm. Are you a fan of filmmakers who want to shoot the rehearsal? Uh, yeah, why not? You know, it's a digital world now. So like, you're not wasting film. Yeah. Uh, and you never know what could come from that piece. You know what I mean? Like something incredible could happen in there, whether it's only a small section or, you know, an incredible long take doesn't matter. Like, let them get what they're there to get. So if they want to shoot the rehearsal, yes, by all means, do it.
How about multiple takes? What's your what's your feeling about multiple takes? Are you a fan of that? Do you like do you like it when they go different angles? Or are you and, and and does that change your performance? Do you tailor yourself toward the angle? You know, I did for a long time. Um, <laughs> I think there there it's twofold. I think that having an awareness of where camera is and what camera is doing is very very smart. Yeah. Knowing what's happening in your environment so that you can maybe tailor a performance to where the camera is, uh, open up slightly, you know, give one eye or the other. Um, I think all of those are very valuable. And at the same time, I think that you have to forget that the camera is there uh, on some regard and just be a human being. She seems to like you. Brother, please. Please. Don't destroy her again. I didn't destroy anybody. You broke her heart! You, with, with your other women, you, you, it killed her! She wanted to be a family! I don't think you need to worry about that this time. Don't! Just, just go! Okay, I won't. Just relax. Mm -hmm. Breathing in the moment. You know, living truthfully, honestly, whatever that story is, whatever that character is going through at that specific time, um, is the most important thing in my, mm -hmm. in my view. So it is that balance between the two. And as far as multiple takes, I think, you know, as many as it takes, yeah. And it often is um, dictated by director style um, and director actor uh, collaboration. Like, what is that mesh? Um, and I've had experiences where it's one or two takes, like rarely ever more than one or two takes. And I've had experiences where you you shoot fifty takes, you know, and that can be exhausting. But it is your job, you know. That is why you're there. So. Some scenes require more takes uh, than others, and then some directors just have different styles. And I'm game for all of it, you know? Are you like, a little worried, though, of the ones that want to just do one take or two take? Do you feel like well, so? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, sometimes, you know, like, especially if you, yeah, if you feel like you didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, if, if, there's, if there's a clear feeling in me after a take, I'm going to say, can I yeah. have one more? I really, I really want one more, um, you know, and sometimes they'll go to playback and we'll, you know, watch it together and I'll be real specific about why I want one more. Um, but if I feel like I need another one, I'm always, always going to ask. And hopefully, you know, a director trusts their actor enough that they're saying something, you know, like they, they know something that's going to help them later in post. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning how you had to tailor your your craft for the camera, and a, and as a theater guy, was that the hardest aspect of getting the film the film industry was learning that there's a camera there and and how it, because in theater you're taught to be big and bold and wide because right. everybody needs to hear you you you're playing for the last row of the theater basically mm -hmm. that's that's what they usually say and then with the film camera it's Real intrusive. It's right there, and I'm just curious if that took some getting used to, and it was that the hardest aspect of it. Yeah, you know, it was it, the the hardest thing about adapting a performance because what you learn ultimately when you boil it down is that our preparation is the same for both. Yeah, you know, you're, you're you're studying a character, you're learning a story. Uh, the foundation of what we do is the same. It's the execution and the way the story is told that is different. So, you know, immediately what I found was that I was too big, right? You know, you're, the choices are too big, you're too bold, um, you're too loud. Like the sound guys over there going like, ah, we got to stop. Why did you hire this theater actor? Because, good God, you're blowing out my drums. Um, you know, the things you learn early on. Yeah, overmodulation, overmodulation. <laughs> yeah, you're peaking. Yeah. Um, so yes, there was a, a period of time, which I think is, you know, to be honest, ongoing, 
Yeah. Um, you learn that you can be subtle. You learn that you can have nuance. You learn, you know, like Paul Newman, just to have layer and layer and layers on the work that you're doing. And that is really exciting. You know, the possibility of making a more real and subtle performance to me is thrilling because I love it when I see it, when I see the work and I'm like, oh man, it's reading and, and things that maybe I did by accident <laughs> are coming through um, just by being really honest and truthful in the moment. Um, and so, yeah, there was a big period of adjustment of getting the stage actor to, to cooperate with the camera. E even the simple things of like flashing the lens and you're like, oh God, I, I keep looking right in the lens. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're having to apologize all the time. I totally yeah, yeah. looked in the lens on that last tag, hey, guys. We got to do it again. I'm sorry. But then you own up to it because you know they're going to find out. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The, camera, the camera doesn't lie. It picks up everything. Yeah. Do you like watching yourself on screen? I do, you know, and it took some time. Like, I think it's important because I, I teach on camera acting as well. And uh -huh. I encourage my students like really, and I kind of make them do it in my class of being able to look past what they see, right? To, so look past what your surface is, look past the features like, oh, I hate my nose, I hate my teeth, I hate my ears, whatever <laughs> you get hung up on. Yeah. Um, you have to be able to look past that and watch what you do. Because if you're able to watch what you do in an objective way, you're able to learn things about going from here to here, mm -hmm. right? Being able to translate what you think into what you see. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that you do that, the more comfortable you get with watching yourself, um, the stronger you become as an actor. And I know there, there are actors that refuse to watch themselves. There are actors that, you know, will say completely opposite of what I'm saying. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to an individual experience, right? Right. You know, we learn all these methods. There's not one method that is going to work for one actor. What happens is we cut and paste and create this own method that's specific to the artist, specific to the actor, on what works for you. What is going to get you to do the best possible work that you can do? That's it. That being said... You, I know you've had this experience before. Is it harder to watch a great performance of yours in a really bad movie? Oh, oh, okay. So you mean like the movie sucks, but the performance is good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. It's really hard. Come on. Yeah. When you. I mean, the good thing is what you find as an actor is like, it's all usable. If yeah, the movie yeah. sucks, it's fine. That's out of your hands. You yeah. cannot control the way the movie is going to look, feel, be cut. Like that is out of your control. The only thing that is in your control is your performance. Mm -hmm. So if you invest yourself in making sure that you're the best fucking actor that you can be and that you are doing the best work that you have done to date. You know what I mean? That should be what you're pushing for all the time is just focus on that work. So if you're in a very bad movie, but you have 30 second clips that you can pull to use to promote yourself in that kind of character that you play, then it's, I mean, then it wasn't for all for naught. You yeah. get to use that to help your career. And the other thing about that aspect of, of the great performance in a crappy movie is that you'll probably get recognized in the review more than you would have. Maybe you would, maybe you were in a small bit part and you yep. just knocked it out of the park. And like, other than, you know, Brian Landis Pokens, this movie sucked ass, but yeah. Brian Landis Pokens is the guy you want to look at for later on, you know? And it happens on stage too. You know, yes. the same thing will happen on stage where you're in a, a play that didn't really come together. Um, but the reviews are coming in. It's like, but you know, the BLF's work is solid. You got to see <laughs> these guys work. You got to go and check it out. So like, 
I mean, if the character is good, like if you're drawn to the character and you connect to the character and the story has potential, then you can get a lot out of it for sure. And it also happens where you're in a good movie and the performance kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because we're the only human, we're not perfect. That's weird, Andy. If you listen to everybody else in your life, one day you're gonna wake up and not know who you are. Don't leave me hanging too long. Get me back to work soon. You know You me. took out to someone work. that was not supposed to be taken out. You had one mark, not two. What was I supposed to do? You were supposed to think! You were supposed to be a professional and think. But you couldn't do that, could you? It's not going to be the way you remember it, though. Who are you people? Lean on my shoulder! I don't want to lean on your shoulder! I want my crutch! Give me my crutch. I just can't control my mouth. I'm on edge here, John. You know that, and I just can't, I just can't. You invited her? Well, I really wanted to see who turned your head. Turned it right around like that girl from The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> this house is on a river, too. She said that's why the garden grows so nice. She said a thousand years ago, there was streams and, and Indians. The sidewalk has so many cracks because the river tries to come back up again. When are we going to get a chance to prove ourselves? You will get your chance, Private. Yes, but when? Do you see a crystal ball anywhere on the lieutenant? Instead of worrying about yourself, maybe you ought to say a prayer or two for those poor bastards storming the beaches right about now. For two men who can take one night not to worry so much, yes. not to question so much, yes. not to obsess so much about their lives and how they end up here on shiny sun lane, whatever the fuck it's called. For two men who can forget all of that and go out. I have mastered the intersection where practical science meets meteorological magic. I've even got the rockets to get it high enough into the sky to shake the moisture loose. I can and will make it rain! I was the one who robbed the old pawnbroker woman and killed her and her sister, Lizavieta, with an axe. I was the one who robbed the old pawnbroker woman and killed her and her sister, Lizavieta, with an axe. <laughs> All this stuff, gone. Psst, gone. And I'm fucking pissed off about it. So you know what I'm thinking? No idea. I'm thinking. I'm so blindly pissed off right now that I could burn this restaurant down to the ground. I was not happy with the Alfredo. Not happy. I, I probably am setting up to talk about your new film here because I think I would imagine, because this is your first starring role, that this was the hardest role you've had to do to date. Am I am I right about that, or is no. there a different one? No, I mean, as far as hardest roles that I've done, I did a production of Bug by Tracy Letts um, that was made into a movie. Michael Shannon was in it, um, and that, <clears throat> hands down, was the hardest work that I've ever done. I 
it, it involved being uh, naked on stage for 10 minutes with nothing to cover you. Both wow. you and your actress were just out there for 10 minutes, nothing to, uh, to do about it. Um, and uh, it required me to like act like I pulled out a tooth. Um, I had bites all over my body. Um, oh, wow. During the whole show, you're constantly itching. And I would take that into my life. Like I couldn't stop in the middle of the night. I would be itching at oh, yeah. things that were not there. Um, and then ultimately, you know, spoiler alert, but at the end of the play, like he pours gasoline over himself, he pours gasoline over her, he lights a match and they fucking die. And so, wow. I mean, from the start to finish, that play kicked my ass. <laughs> uh, and luckily it was an hour away. So I had the drive out there to kind of prepare for it. And then I had the dr drive back to kind of decompress from it. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it tweaked me and it proved, you know, I did things in that play that I didn't know I was capable of doing. Mm. Um, you know, and as it, uh, you know, okay, okay rent a pal um, was challenging in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this play, uh, I'm doing this movie coming out of a divorce. So I had a lot of things to kind of uh, work from mm -hmm. and, it, I needed, you know, it's funny, the law of attractions. I really put out in the universe right at my, at the, the end of my divorce, um, that I really needed a role in a feature film that I could sink my teeth into. Like I put it into the universe, like, please send me this thing. And I was reaching out to some of my friends that had gone through divorce. And one of them was John Stevenson. And he and I had worked together most recently on hoax. Um, and I knew that he was going through a divorce and I just wanted to see like, how have things been for you professionally, personally? And he's like, it's so funny that you reached out to me because I have this feature film that I've written and I think you'd be perfect for it. And he sent me the script and I was nine pages in Joe. And I was like, <laughs> I have to do this movie. Oh, I nice. have to do this movie. Like I just knew right from the get, it was just such an interesting concept. It uh, was such an interesting character. It was dark and uh, quirky in that indie world. It was like everything just kind of lined up. And it's funny how the universe just sends you these things. Um, I didn't have to audition for it. It was a flat out offer. Um, and I mean, it was just perfect for where I was in my life, for where I was in my career, everything just kind of lined up. And it's a fantastic movie. It really is a good movie. Yeah. And you got some known names in the movie as well. We've got Will Wheaton, y'all. Yeah. We've got Will Wheaton, the, the star of Stand By Me, the <laughs> you know, star of Star Trek, you know, regular on Big Bang Theory. Will Whedon, and just the nicest guy you could ever meet. Such a <laughs> professional. And I think he's going to surprise the world with what he does in this movie. The, the nice. work, the caliber of work is really, really good. Um, and he goes places that you've never seen Will go, like as far as within the work. Um, I think the world is definitely going to be kind of surprised by what he, what he did on this film. It's awesome. And I think the world needs the BLF too. And I think that they're going to, they're going to get a lot of that from this movie. So that's awesome. You know, the world desperately needs the BLF. Um, <laughs> they don't know it yet. And I think, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have opportunities uh, in my career uh, like this. Um, and, you know, this is all about relationships. Like this yeah. business is all about relationships. And it proves itself time and time again, like reaching out to a fellow filmmaker who's also a friend. And because of the relationship we had, I can ask them a personal question and it turns into this incredible opportunity for, you know, both of us um, with his film. And, you know, I'm just so grateful that in Denver, we don't get a lot of feature films. 
Right. You don't get a lot of opportunities to tell stories like this. And so I'm just so grateful that I was able to make this film in Colorado with the incredible people that are here, that live here, that work here, um, and that the film turned out the way it did. And, you know, oddly, being sold in the middle of a pandemic really helped it. Nice. Um, the film, in a lot of ways, is about isolation. Uh, the film, in a lot of ways, is about a relationship with the screen. Um, a, a lot of the things that people are going through right now, um, they can definitely connect to with David, who's in, you know the character in this film uh, and his relationship with it. I'm Carla. Hi, my name is Mary. Hi, uh, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm David. I'm 40 years young, <laughs> and um, I live with my mother. It's okay. Can I, Mom? I'm looking for a deep connection, someone I can give myself to completely. Hi, I'm Andy. Thanks for being here today. I have been waiting for this moment for what feels like forever. Two friendship. We're going to get to know each other. Friendship. Talk about whatever you want. But more than anything, we're going to have some fun. Too bad. And hopefully, yeah. it's the start of a beautiful relationship. Yeah. What do you say? Sounds weird, Andy. Hi, uh, I'm Lisa. You want to hang out tomorrow night? I'd, I'd love to. Maybe someone will come around that can help you out a little. I thought we could tell each other everything. You just need to open yourself up to it. I thought we were best friends. Nothing like a little friendly competition. Right, pal? That's what friends are for. You're just drunk with infatuation for some cute girl to be there for each other. We don't need her. We have each other. When all the chips are down. You've taken everything from me. Andy, I need that's why I'm here for you, pal. You're someone who, who I, I know, uh, you know, personally, and you have, you absorb a lot. You're a sponge for a lot yeah. of things. You're very smart and you're, you're very, you're very apt and you, you realize that you're always learning and, you know, with doing all these different characters, I'm wondering what, to give to you and how you uh, take that into the next performance. Is it, is it something you think about consciously or is it something that just happens? I will say that I always learn something in every project that I do. Mm -hmm. What that is, who knows? Like it could be so many different things. Um, the way that I prep for a project, I like to do a lot of research. Um, I like to kind of sink in uh, dig into the world that I'm about to live in. And so, you know, example, I did a play that was about uh, a guy that kind of cons people for stamps, very expensive stamps. So I learned about stamps. I learned about stamp collecting. I became dangerously close to becoming a stamp collector. <laughs> very, very close because it's so interesting. The stamps are beautiful little pieces of art. Um, so I like to learn about the world. I played a firefighter once. And so I did a ride along with Denver Fire One. You know, I, I'm a kind of actor that wants to submerge myself in the thing that I'm about to portray. So right. I always come away from projects, learning some kind of skill, um, learning something about myself, uh, learning something about my craft. And then, yeah, you're collecting all of these things along the way. So one project is going to lead to the next and you're going to carry what you've learned into that next project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest thing that for me is that each character that I play from project to project has to be vastly different from the last one. Because the last thing I want to do, Joe, is get typecast. But yeah, I, I am a character actor to my core, um, to my soul. And so 
I really kind of pride myself and challenge myself with making sure that whatever is the next project for me shows a, a much wider range than whatever I did last. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's my biggest stipulation. I, I mean, I want to find the best stories, obviously. I want to find the most interesting characters. And I just want to make sure that my body of work reflects the fact that I'm a character actor. If you that being said, are you somebody who likes more likes to play a villain, a hero, or do you like to be the guy who steals the scene? <laughs> well, we all hope that we steal the scene, right? Right, right, right. You don't matter what you do, right? You know, we all want to be able to like let the cream rise to the top. You want to <laughs> people to see the work and be like, oh my god, you know, I. I the perfect kind of actor for me, uh, I want to be that guy where you like, oh, I know him. He's in everything. What's his name? <laughs> I want to be that guy, which Philip Seymour Hoffman was uh, before he became Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. He was in all these little indies and people didn't know his name, but they loved his work. Yeah. Um, like I would be super happy to, to fill that role. Um, yeah, Sam Rockwell. You, yeah, Sam Rockwell, exactly. <laughs> and he's like, you know, super stud. Yeah. Um, so as it pertains to like villains, uh, heroes, you know, I like a darker character. I can tell yeah. you that much. Um, and and I like quirky, and I like interesting, and I like characters that are going to push me. So most of the time, I will get a villain, or I will get. Yeah, because villains are so much fun to play. Are you kidding me? They're so, and they're so challenging to play them, you know, not as the norm. Yeah, yeah. You really kind of make a villain likable, right? Mm -hmm. Make a bad guy someone the audience connects with so they actually have to toil with the fact of how they feel about them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, sure. What is your favorite night on stage? Do you are you an opening night guy, closing night? Oh. Do you like the Sunday matinees? What do you like? I'm an opening night guy. Yeah, there is a magic that happens on opening nights, and whether I'm in the play or not, I'm an opening night kind of guy. Like I just love coming together in that way. You know, you've worked all this time, you put all this energy into this thing. Um, everybody that loves this particular theater is coming to the show for opening night. You've got all the supporters, you've got press, you've got fellow artists. Um, it's usually a very supportive crowd. Mm -hmm. Um, they're there to like be there for theater and that's, there's a beauty to that. Um, also at the theater where I'm a company member, uh, curious theater opening nights are part of our like culture. Yeah. We, as company members will come in and help cook um, the opening night spread. So we get to like hang out, be around each other. We're supporting our fellow artists that are out there working for their, their, you know, first major audience. Uh, and then after we have a big party, we eat, we drink, we talk about theater. We talk about the play that you just saw. We talk about what's next. Like, in this pandemic, what I miss most of all is being around those people. Yeah. Like being around the kind, your people, like your yeah. people. I miss my people, Joe. <laughs> like, it, you know, this, this thing is keeping me from my people. Yeah. It's just a magical, magical thing, an opening night um, gala with the party and the food and the drink. What's more difficult for you, drama or comedy? What do you comedy. have to prepare I think for? comedy is just, it's hard to pull off comedy because, I mean, first you have to get a, a sense of the world that you're living in. So, like, the sensibility of the director. What kind of comedy is this? You know? Are, are we pushing things a little bit? Or are we more in the realistic world? Or are we, you know, way understated in the comedy? Right. Um, I love the comedy that comes from real life. I, I love the comedy of the day to day that we live. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like those dark comedies are right up my alley. The, 
you know, the funny in the absurd. I have a delivery for Mr. or Mrs. James Jensen. Okay, if I could just obtain your signature. What's wrong? Uh, you signed it, Jim Jensen. Yeah. So? Well, this delivery is for Mr. or Mrs. James Jensen. Uh, what do you love about the indie film world in particular for as, as from an actor standpoint? I mean, obviously the pay is not the thing that you love about indie film, but... Well, it's better in theater. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I've been working in theater for so long that, you know, any kind of film pay is, is usually <laughs> better than what you're making in theater. Um, and the other side of the point is that I haven't had many opportunities to do anything other than indie. Yeah. Of geographically, where I live in Denver, we just don't get a lot of uh, bigger film section. Yeah. Um, but to really answer your question is because of the stories. Like I find the stories that are in these indie movies uh, fascinating and interesting and important and the stories that help people. Like I really enjoy being a part of a story that affects someone on a molecular level that has the potential to change someone's life because they've watched it. Mm. You know, like I have, I really believe that we have the power to affect people on a very deep level with the stories that we tell and that we should take that into consideration as artists when we're looking for, you know, it's a weird thing being an actor in Denver, you want to do anything. Like yeah. anything comes your way, especially film, you just want to be a part of it because you want to work so bad. You're so desperate to be able to make movies here yeah. that we forget sometimes that we have the choice to say no when yeah. the story is not lining up with the kinds of stories that we want to tell. And the older I get, the less patience I have to tell stories that I don't want to tell. Yeah. You know what I mean? So sure. I, think that, I think that's a blessing to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to be selective now about the stories that I want to be involved with. For sure. And, you know, I've been looking for the next eternal sunshine of the spotless mind for years. <laughs> so if you're out there watching this and you have that script, please reach out to me because <laughs> I want to make your movie. Yeah. You, you know, you've dabbled in producing and I'm curious, have you ever thought about writing and directing yourself? No, I'd be a terrible director. <laughs> I just, it's not in my wheelhouse. Like yeah. maybe, maybe later, I don't know. But for the time being, uh, I, I'm a collaborator and I, I want to find those writers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I want to find the people that can write the stories that I want to tell. I'm an idea man. Um, you know, I want to cultivate a lot of different stories. I have probably a dozen scripts that I'm connected to. Features, shorts, pilots, um, uh, stories that I want to tell. Um, I'm not a writer, and so I'm just looking for people to collaborate with. I'm looking for writers whose voice I really like. Um, and I got to find those right writers to write my ideas because I want to make that content. I uh -huh. really want to, and from start to finish, like I want to produce and go pre-production all the way through post involved, but I can't write and I'm not a director. Um, and ultimately uh, being a producer just allows me to, make the movies that are good for me and my career. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I can find characters that normally I wouldn't be cast as produce it and put myself in it. Um, there comes a time in your career where you really have to 
put your career in your own hands. Yeah. And realize that, you know, all these people that you think can make or break you, just make the movies, make the content that you want to do and everything else will follow suit. Right? Like eventually you're bound, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years, man. And I finally got a film that lined up in all the right categories. You know, I finally got a product that is going to be seen by a lot more people. I finally just got to the place where it's like, just make the movies you want to make, make the movies you want to see. I'm sure that you look forward to the day and I know that it's coming and that it will happen. And it may just happen after Renapal. You never know never that know. you start getting offers and not have to audition anymore <laughs> because that's the bait of an actor's existence, right? Is the audition. You and know, it's just not, it's, it's an imperfect process. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it is sure. not something, I mean, think about what actors have to put themselves through in order to get a role, especially in LA on a higher, you know, on a higher level, having to yeah. go, seven, eight uh, callbacks and uh, studio tests and being in front of producers like, oh my God, <laughs> it sounds just gut-wrenching. Um, but I will say one thing as far as the audition is concerned, um, something that shifted in me and I saw a, an interview with like, I think Brian Cranston and he really kind of broke it down was there, there was a time in his, in his work and his career where it shifted where you didn't look at this audition as like, this is a job opportunity. Like the auditions is the work. This is what we're doing day in, day out. Booking a job is like icing on the cake. You know what I mean? Right. Booking a job is like the dessert. You get to like, oh, this is so good. You know, audition, if you can shift your mind and your focus to look at these auditions, they were never your jobs to begin with until they are your jobs. So yeah. if you can just go in there, play, have a good time, uh, be directable, be someone that is enjoyable to be around. I mean, because that's part of the, most of the audition these days is like, do I want to be on set with this guy for 14, yeah. 16 hours a day? He seems <laughs> like an asshole. Like, I don't think I want him on set. Um, yeah. You know, just being a likable guy, being directable, you know, being someone yeah. that can be collaborative. Like, I just look at auditions so differently now. And there was a big change in me booking and in my work when I made that shift of like, get rid of the pressure, go have fun. So what does every Brian Landis Vulcan's performance have to have? Oh, what does every BLF performance have to have? Let's see. I mean, for me, if we're going to just be simple about it, it has to be real. It has to be grounded in truth. It has to be honest. Um, and I push myself to kind of achieve all of those things in everything that I do. I, because I, that's what I want to see. You know what I mean? When I see yeah. a story, whether it's on stage or on screen, I want to get lost in that world. I want to get lost in the story that's being told through these characters. And if it's not real, it pulls me out, right? If it's not honest, I don't believe it. And so I try to hold myself up to that same standard where just be real, be honest, tell the truth. Tell, tell the story, get out of your own way. What do you juggle typically, just balls? I mostly just juggle balls. You know, I do, you know, in my repertoire, I do pins, uh, Chinese yo-yo, uh, sticks, contact juggling, plates, um, I balance a chair on my face, um, but on on the normal, it's just three three and four ball juggling is what kind of gives me that focus. Um, I'll, play, I'll play a piece of music 
that becomes my juggling song for like a year. Um, my my most recent song was uh, Makeba by Jane. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that song. It's fantastic. It's a great song. <laughs> to. Um, 